got Serena Pearson from Caden, SEO manager from Caden, um, Alex Dewey from C Senior SEO Specialist at Liberty Marketing, and Signable and One Up's own MJ. Um, so, uh, Alex, do you want to kick us off? Sure, okay. So, um, after this, you're going to receive a, a short document from me, and I just want to talk about some of the things we can do to improve our websites, um, some of the tools we can use, and hopefully think about some of the workflows. So a big thing for me when we're looking at startup business especially, um, I went through that process. I started a, a, a pet shampoo company, got to first place there on Amazon, um, started a whole content marketing strategy, backlinking, all that kind of stuff. Went really well, it paid my rent, and I, I had a wonderful life off of it for a, for a few years. But one of the things that I found really annoying is when you start getting into SEO and, and optimizing for search, the tools, the cost, and really cutting through the noise of, you know, you need to pay us this much money for this little amount of information that you probably can't use that well anyway. So let's talk through a, a few of the top tips for getting started with it, what you're going to need to know and what tools. So the first thing I always like to think about is measuring your website properly. Um, so you can do this through lots of different ways. A lot, a lot of SEOs will traditionally like to think about S, uh, Screaming Frog. So you're going to crawl your website, get all that data, all that good stuff. Brilliant. Um, more traditional marketers will think Google Analytics, brilliant also. What we want to do is get past the traditional look at um, Google Analytics uh, and traditional metrics, bounce rate, click through, how are we using this information to better our business? Um, so for example, um, with one of my larger clients, I recently rolled out this change on their site where we use Google Tag Manager. Now, if you're unaware, Google Tag Manager lets you go in um, quickly iterate and implement tracking changes if you want to. You can also inject some HTML, JavaScript, all that kind of really fun stuff. Do check it out if you don't know it. Um, so what I did for these guys is I implemented a, a change that let us see which customers were seeing which stock level messages. And then we could compare those conversion rates over time. So we could see that our quick delivery in stock message had a conversion rate of about 4%, whereas where their fulfillment suffered and we got further down the list to like eight months delivery time the conversion rate was about 1.3 percent so we straight away can make an informed decision okay it zero cost there's some simple tools online to help you set up something like this um and they can see okay if we better our fulfillment we can now split test the difference between what level of stock to, do we need to be holding to improve our, our sales performance there um you can't talk about <laughs> measuring your website without talking about page speed. It's a huge thing for me. Um, I do a lot of tech SEO these days and I, I absolutely love this stuff. Um, so some tools you're going to want to check out are page speed insights. Um, so you can jump into page speed insights, throw in your website and it'll give you a, a, a report. It'll give you some scores. Be aware of that. The, there's two sets of scores. There's rum data, which is real user data that's coming from, um, <laughs> from Chrome browser users. And then there's also lab data. When looking at the suggestions they have, such as improving um, image formats, uh, main thread work in JavaScript, all these are theoretical improvements on times based on their lab data. So it, a lot, <laughs> some SEOs will say, okay, you need to improve all your images by making them all WebP and you'll save three seconds. But sometimes it will say your, your, your page only takes two seconds to load. So if you see that kind of, uh, disparity between information that's where it's coming from uh, a favorite of mine is actually gt metrics so gt metrics combines some of the good stuff from page speed insights some of the good stuff from sort of chrome dev tools and my favorite thing to do there is throw it into gt metrics and there's a waterfall graph and you can sort by document size and where it's happening in the in the render queue and you can see exactly what's slowing your website down what file size it is and you can make really good informed decisions that way um, so, yeah, so page speed, there's a lot uh, you can get into. There's stuff in Google Analytics as well to track it. Um, I definitely suggest setting up the Chrome user experience report, data studio that's floating around on the internet. You can plug, plug in your website, you can see the data that you've got over time historically, and you need to make sure that you're not regressing. So, obviously, page speed is a ranking factor, especially with mobile first indexing. We need to make sure that. Our sites are quick and then as we make changes and implement SEO they, they stay quick. Um, 
I'm going to try and fly through some of these other suggestions, but I don't want to just waffle on too much about tech. Um, okay, so review, review your organic strategy. Um, a lot of people often start with, with very big dreams about SEO. Um, okay, we're going to become the best person when it comes to PC components. Um, now, that's a very tough market if you want, <laughs> want to rank first for PC components. So make sure you're looking at all the important competitor metrics that are sort of proprietary in the, in, in the industry. So check out backlink profiles, check out page speed scores, check out social signals. All these things will give you a better picture to let you know where your website can compete in. If your backlink profile is weak, you can't compete with back, big backlink profiles. If your backlink profile is strong, but your page is taking 25 seconds to load and it's 13 megabytes, there's no way that's gonna rank on mobile because that is a bad user experience. Um, so always, try to take a data-driven approach when it comes to these sort of competition metrics. Don't just resort to, okay, they've got a DA of 42, my DA is 55, I'm gonna beat them, because it's, it, it's not that simple. Um, one of my favorite things uh, bring into the, the world of SEO is cannibalization. So you can use uh, Google Search Console, you can go in there, there's some uh, cool tools. My favorite tool for Search Console is it's Sheets Analytics search analytics for sheets it's in chrome you can throw that into google sheets and what you can do is you can export 5,000 rows from your google search console then you can run some wicked awesome analysis um i use it for finding cannibalization so we, with that we can find where different urls that we're ranking compete with each other so if you're if you've got two different pages targeting the same keyword they're going to compete and they're both going to rank weaker than if you had one consolidated piece of information with that, you can find these opportunities. Obviously, there's a lot of different strategies you'll have around fixing that. But the, the key point here is when you're getting started, you need to identify these issues so we don't carry them on going forward. Um, leverage, leveraging modern search features is the next point I've got listed in my, uh, my handout. Now, this is something that excites me a lot because um, as a startup, this is an area you can shine. This is such a golden opportunity because in smaller companies, we can be more agile, we can be more reactive, um, opportunities open themselves up. We're often using better tech in the web stack. So I see a lot of, a lot of guys doing really cool stuff with like static site generators and Gatsby and all this kind of really cool stuff that's all, all coming out now versus old clunky WordPress sites that we have to get away from. Um, so when I say leverage modern search features, I've included a link to the Google search gallery. Now what we have there is all the different rich snippets that Google are adding, including the ones that are in beta. So some of the ones that are in beta are like the software app, um, that there's, they're reintroducing restaurant carousels as well. So these are all things that we can use structured data to mark up on our pages to let Google know that they can use these, these special features. And these special features often appear at the top of the pages. They can result in some zero uh, click searches and stuff like that. But it's, it's something to be aware of when taking into account the strategy. But uh, a really cool workflow that I implement is using Visual Ping. So there's this tool called Visual Ping, uh, very Googleable, And you can set that up to monitor one page for free for, a, for an entire month. So you can just monitor one page uh, ad infinitum. And you could uh, set that up on the Google Developer Docs page. So instead of waiting for their newsletters and their conferences to say this feature has been rolled out, we're testing this in the certs, you can see straight away when someone push, pushes that code live to that page. So you can start planning your, <laughs> your rich strategy, your rich feature, your feature snippet strategy around the, the things as they're released. Um, it's, it's really cool. It's really good to get ahead of that. Um, because it's always really embarrassing as an agency to have someone come to you and say, oh, this has come out and you don't know about it. So it's good to have both agency side and client side, but we've also found it's been great. Um, so I've got some larger clients who've recently applied to some of the beta programs for these new features. Um, and it's just good to be able to have these, these quick wins available to us. Um, let's talk about mobile first. So Everything you need to be doing needs to be mobile first. It's 2020, uh, everyone's got a mobile. Um, I guess that's quite a lot of privilege me saying that. A lot of us have a mobile and, and a lot of us have good connections. 
Google tests for bad connections on bad mobiles. So we need to make sure that what we're doing on mobile is slick. Um, so there's plenty of tools that, that we can use to measure and track this, including the, the Lighthouse scores, and we can see our mobile stuff in there. Um, the, the thing that I'd like to shine a bit more light on here is uh, in Search Console, there's the mobile usability report. So in there, we can see issues with, with our, our mobile sites. Um, so click targets being too close together. Um, there's some, a few other things, text too small to read, usability stuff. Um, this is great at being in Search Console. It means we don't need to spend loads of money on some amazing audits. We can see it ourselves. We, we quickly can identify which pages have issues and we can fix those and then we can have better results in the mobile index. Um, so I've, it rolls into sort of my next point. We need to put users first. Now, this is the fluffiest thing I'll say in the world of SEO, because by putting users first, uh, how do we measure the return on investment of putting users first? What is putting users first? Um, the return on investment is, is, is a long-term one. By putting users first, we want to improve conversion rates and future-proof ourselves from um, algorithm updates. So for example, the, the latest that we're seeing from the Lighthouse version six, um, the stuff they were talking about uh, very recently on Web Dev Live, included some new metrics such as cumulative layout shift. Now Google described this as visual stability um, and there's a, an, an amazing GIF where someone goes to click on a, a cancel button and then due to a, 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 a pop-up banner or something, it pushes the buy button down and then you, you hit the buy button by mistake. Um, if we can take a look at our websites objectively and notice these issues before uh, they become measured and scored and weighted on in the SERPs, um, we can prevent a lot of the damage done by, uh, you know, these, these big changes that get rolled out over time. So, for example, um, if we look at it on the, the linking side, there was uh, big changes in the industry that meant people could no longer buy loads of links from link farms. And everybody that did this was penalized in a similar way to on site tech. If you're trying to force down like five different JavaScript libraries, 20 meg payload size, all into a, a 3G Motorola 5G or whatever they test on that's a really bad experience. One, because it's gonna load really slowly and you're not gonna be able to do it and you can't even convert if you wanted to. Two, um, Google take into account data usage. Um, so if, you're, if your page, if you've got two pages and one's 20 meg and it loads in two seconds, do some very, very clever coding and, and then the other one's only under 1.6 meg is, is sort of what I aim for on agency side. Uh, 1.6 meg's gonna win duly just because of that um the the data that's required to download those packages on the on your website um i think that's really it from me uh, i'm i'm here more i guess to answer any questions about tech stuff um any specific issues you have yeah th throw them at me really fabulous thank you very much alex um serena do you want to to go next and talk about what you want to talk about yeah, so my name is Serena and I work at Kaizen, which is a growth marketing agency um, that is based in London. So I've worked there for a few years now and um, a lot of what we do is involved with digital PR, but we also support in on-site content, technical SEO and expanding our services um, among the wider marketing mix. Um, so that's generally my background of what I want to discuss today. Um, focusing more on the content side, but also your, I mean, similar to what Alex was saying, you know, the mobile user journey, um, which is quite important. Um, so, I mean, before, you know, going into it, just a bit more background myself. So I've been working, working um, in marketing for four years. So I started with um, a more broad in-house role, doing everything from, you know, copywriting, helping the CRO team, just anywhere I was needed. Um, but I did, you know, similar to Alex, quickly find love for the technical side of things. Um, I suppose because it can be a lot more measurable to find the results. So even, you know, from the content side, if you're running a digital PR campaign or social media, um, this creative aspect, you know, we find more success if it is based on data, if it's, you know, approaching it from a technical perspective. Um, so that's one of the main reasons why, you know, I particularly advocate for that. Um, but, you know, for smaller businesses, 
um, ultimately you're more likely to have a smaller website. And with smaller websites, you know, there is typically, you know, less technical work that is needed because you are still building your brand. Um, so with that, you know, it's important to consider all different aspects. So if you're looking at the technical side, for example, page speed, as Alex touched on, is so important. Um, and having that user experience, I think ultimately from a technical perspective, um, accessibility is the number one thing at this time. So to ignore uh, you know, the global pandemic, to ignore everything that's going on, um, it, I think is a mistake for your business. You need to factor that into everything, including SEO. And so from an accessibility standpoint, you know, your website should be accessible anyway. But um, I think now is a good time for you to check, you know, go on your mobile phone. Because I think from an SEO standpoint, we're on our desktops quite a lot when we're working on websites. So literally pulling out your mobile phone and seeing if you can access certain things. Also, another tip is um, as an SEO, you're very familiar with your website. Even if you're a business owner, you know where everything and anything is. And then that is maybe a barrier to entry for your consumers. So if you're living with someone, you know, your partner, you know, kids or anything who aren't SEOs, that is an excellent opportunity to just give them the website and ask them to find something um, because the way they may interact with your website is completely different to what you do. So um, ultimately, you should be doing what you should be doing anyway, um, which is making your website accessible, but just make sure to review that in that time um, from a technical perspective. And moving on to content, which I think is also important um, for this time. Um, I think at the moment, there are obviously quite a lot of budget cuts um, with, with Corona. Um, there's a lot of slashed paid budgets, a lot of slashed PR budgets. And so it's important to make sure that you utilize what you have as well as you have. There isn't really the budget to be running these huge, large content campaigns, which mean we might want to do previously. Um, so, you know, creating a big interactive tool may not be on the radar for the time being. So you have to adjust um, your strategy, strategy to be a lot more reactive. Uh, the new space is changing week by week. You know, one week there's all these deaths, then the next week there's a famine somewhere else. So, um, it, you know, to, to have a really long term strategy on where you want to approach your um, off site SEO and build links, it's not going to quite work for this period of time. So, what we found to be really useful is to just be aware on Twitter, read the news every single day, follow journal requests, and see where your business can make that presence um, from an SEO space. So something as simple, um, if you're a business owner, for example, just providing a quote, something as small as that takes you 10 minutes, you know, getting in contact with the, with the journalist, you can just build a link that way. You don't have to overthink your offsite strategy and build something super elaborate. Um, it was just like Alex touched on. I think when we start SEO, we have a huge vision of what it would be, but just starting off with these little steps just to keep it going and maintain that, um, maintain that relationship. Um, and also from an on-site content perspective, um, again, back to that accessibility. So similar with resourcing, we don't have time to, to, you know, produce 50 different new pages on how to best use your product or, you know, long, long tail keywords. That resource just isn't so available anymore. So revisit what you have at the moment and make sure that, especially if you're in retail, your product descriptions are, are as good as they can be more and more people are spending time at home and so they, they have more time to browse there's a lot of online shopping available i've bought so many things i don't need in the past few months because i want to compensate for not going outside um so for instance a skipping rope which is something i bought recently you know in that whole journey to purchase i looked at you know various brands i looked at all the different product descriptions Consumers have that time now to actually do their research when they're buying things instead of, say, on the train on the way to work. So um, making it good, you, you can't really afford to ignore that in this time because it can cost you a sale. Um, so that's really important. Um, and, you know, while your product descriptions, for example, at this time can be quite good, um, it's missing certain elements. So again, if you're in retail, if you go into a shop, you might try on an, a, an item of clothing, for example, and you might notice that, oh, because of this particular material, it doesn't feel so good or whatever. That information isn't necessarily available in the product description. So it's important that you get your reviews on point. 
And from an SEO perspective, that this counts. This isn't a product team's um, job. You know, having a good review means that you can put good schema markup and that's gonna really improve your click-through rate. It doesn't have to be, again, a dramatic change. You can just contact your email marketing team or product team and ask them, hey, if they've purchased the product, ask them to review it. Um, so, and if they don't, try not bug them with it. I got way too many emails about re you know, reviewing the skipping rope. Um, so, you know, making sure you keep your customer at a good balance. Um, so, I mean, that's sort of in a nutshell um, how we've responded to the whole corona situation. And also we have to think a bit further. So once, you know, restrictions are lifted, we almost have to predict certain things. And ultimately there isn't data for that. Um, you know, we, we, we've never been in this global pandemic situation where we have all this Google Trends data we can have a look at. So um, just being very aware of your customers and what they're looking for, if possible, and if you have the resource, have those analytics implemented. So again, with GTM, make sure you know where they're actually looking on the website because it's indicative of what their consumer trends might be later, um, where there's just nowhere to measure that sort of data right now. Um, and I think that's sort of mostly it. Um, I also wanted to touch um, a little bit on apps as well. So if you're a business um, that has an app, you know, what can you do in this time? So um, a seamless customer experience is what we're always striving for. So faster page speed, easier navigation, you know, maybe sticky heading or something like that. Um, and that's something you can also transition smoothly into your apps. So more people are staying at home, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be on their laptops all the time. There's still teenagers stuck in their rooms on their phones. You know, everyone's still on their phone, even though they're at home, television, television is on, there's a lot of screens. Um, so don't neglect the app perspective of it. Um, one thing you can do is Firebase indexing. So if you don't know what this is, it's essentially when you're on Google and you're, you're searching for a company, say it's um, a news application, um, so Twitter, um, you click on the, the link and instead of taking you to the website version, it takes you to the app version. And so um, if you don't have the app, it's no bother. You're not going to be you know, bugging your users, download the app now, now, now. It's annoying for everybody. Um, but if they do have the app, they can click on it and it takes them to the, to the app. And then that's where you can you know, retain user engagement and just making it a little bit more seamless. Um, so in terms of implementation times, it's, it's a little bit of time to implement. Obviously you need to go into Xcode if it's an iOS um, app or you know, Android Studio and make some changes, but it doesn't have to be as difficult as it is. Ultimately in a condensed um, version, you upload a file to your website, to the root domain, the second one is uploading some files to your app. And then the third one is validating it. That's sort of it in a nutshell. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but Google has really detailed guidelines on how to implement this. And if you're an SEO or ASO, it's something you can look into and really help out the resource and the development team, because I'm sure they're also busy. Um, so I think that's, that's everything um, that I wanted to cover um, from my perspective. Fabulous, that was really brilliant, thank you. And MJ, do you want to, to talk about your stuff now? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see if I can share my screen because I made a fancy presentation for this. There we go. Can you guys see that? Awesome. So I'm gonna be looking over my webcam because my screen is here and the webcam is there. So not trying to be awkward here. But um, basically I made a bit of a, um, um, I listed a method on how to expand your reach during uh, this time, because as well as you might be super busy, there are also some businesses that might have a bit more time because business is not as booming or is not going as quick as usual. So you want to expand your, uh, your reach. Um, and you can do this with the ABC method. Um, and I'm quite a fan of that method myself. Uh, so as I said, you could have a bit more time. You want to draw more attention to your website. You want to share, uh, the valuable information that you have as a business owner. Um, so where do you start? For this example, let's make it easy. I'm a guy who likes sneakers. You can see in my mirror there, there's a picture of a Jordan 11. There's a shoe I got married in, love sneakers. So in this example, we're gonna start a sneaker blog. So you make a list of 10 keywords in your niche. So that's sneakers, Nike, Adidas, Jordan, sneaker care, storage, bloggers, art releases, the whole bunch. What you do then, you put all those keywords one by one into Google, but you put A, B, C after each keyword. 
And what you see, what will happen is Google is going to auto suggest certain searches that Google has found that come up more often or are very popular. And you can take the interesting one out of the interesting ones out of there. So um, why do you want to do it? That's a good question. Well, you find things that you might have never thought of. So I went for sneakers and all the way when I came to the U, I found sneakers under 100, which is a really interesting blog if you want to make, um, it's a really interesting topic if you want to make a blog about sneakers, because there's probably a lot of people looking for sneakers under 100 pounds. Sneakers you can wear to work, sneakers you can wear with a dress, wear without socks, maybe you can wear it to, the, to your wedding, who knows? Um, but also sneakers vegan, like, that sounds like a really interesting thing. The vegan community is, is growing in the last few years. Uh, sneaker community has been growing in the last few years. Maybe that's a really nice correlation. You never know. But you take all those keywords and you put them into a list. So in this example, I just took sneaker and I put all the uh, long tail keywords that you get out of this in a list. And now you want to see how well you want to prioritize them. So which ones are the important keywords and which ones are the less important keywords? So you put them into Google Trends, which is a really rough sketch on how much um, something has been searched in Google. So over here, I put like five of my keywords in there and I didn't expect this, but Sneaker Vegan is super popular. So maybe that's a blog I want to start with and write about the things that, um, what makes a sneaker vegan or um, what are sneaker, vegan sneaker brands? Uh, what are they made out of? How do they replace leather? Um, stuff like that. But right now I'm not sure what the intention is, but I know that the topic should be around this. Sneakers under hundred and upcoming sneakers are also quite steady in traffic. So there may be like more like um, sneakers under hundred could be like more like an evergreen thing. Sneakers under hundred for like in 2020 and then every year you give it an update. Think about stuff like that. Also a tip, look for seasonality in those keywords. If you look at like sneakers in the winter, obviously they're gonna trend much more in the winter than they do in the summer, logically. But there might be some keywords in there that have a seasonality that you didn't expect. And then you want to time whether, when you want to write your blog and when you want to release it. Um, so it links up with that growth that you see every year. So if you prioritize it, um, I just gave it a simple uh, ranking from one to 10 and Sneaker Yeezy got a 10 because um, lots of traffic really blew everything out of the water. Um, Sneaker Vegan followed after that and the upcoming and under 100 got a score of eight. The rest is a little bit lower. Am I never going to write about those topics? I don't think so. I think there's still good things to have and things to write about and it's definitely stuff that people have searched for. Um, but they don't have my top priority to write about right now. So now I know the topic, but I want to write the blog. So I kind of want to know what is ranking, how long are the articles, what do the articles say, and who writes the article? If I go back and I look at uh, Sneaker Yeezy, if I search for that, all I see is where to buy them, how to buy them, uh, what's the current price of a Sneaker Yeezy, who is reselling them. And if I write a blog just to inform people or just to get like some traffic on it, then that might not be the best thing to write about, even though it gets lots of traffic, it might, might not be fitting the, the intention that I want to follow for my blog. So I look for sneakers vegan. And what do I find? Well, I find that most blogs are written between 2000 and 3000 words. They have a very clear problem. Um, they want to find out which sneakers are vegan and where can I buy them? The top sites have lots of images, Instagram links, and uh, they have lists and there are no really big names in the top 10. But Big names, I mean, there's no like um, Complex, BBC, um, Nike, Adidas. They don't have like big blogs written about it. So that from my first site, there could be a really good chance that I can rank on that first page. Obviously, what Alex said, have a look, if you want to look like a bit deeper, look at page speed, how many backlinks they have, have some data to work on the back of. But in your first view, I always look at like how many big names do I see in the list. And that's kind of like my, my guess if I have an opportunity to rank for this. So for Sneakers Vegan, I think I could have a good opportunity to rank. Um, so the word count, don't take this as, as fact. Like if I write a blog of 4,000 words, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be automatically number one. But it gives you a good estimate like 
how beefy your content must be. Like a 500 page blog is probably not gonna cut it in this list unless you have a fantastic backlink a profile and a super quick website and people are really engaged with your website and click through and watch everything and never go back. But that's a very rare instance. So what's next? You made the blog, you posted it, you know it's all timing, you know people can find it in search. In my experience, it takes about six to eight months to get like a stable ranking. So leave it on there for a bit of time. Keep an eye on Google search uh, on the search console for the queries that people find it on. And maybe you can tweak your blog a little bit to match the queries. If it does really well on a certain query that you want to rank for that you haven't really thought about before. Um, but after six to eight months, I often find that it finds like a place and maybe it moves like three, four, five spots up and up and down very rarely. But uh, especially in the beginning when it's trying to find its spot in the ranking, it's bouncing all over the place and Google is really testing if this content is working for you. So leave it on there, look on search results, results for queries, and you should be good. So that's a very basic, quick overlook on how to write content, what to write for your content, and how to get like a bit more reach for your website. Quick bonus tip, add schema to your article. As Alex and Serena said before, schema is fantastic. If you don't know about it, if you're new to this, Google it, search it. There's lots of stuff um, to read up on it. And it's, it's quite easy to wrap your head around. Um, one of the schemas that I'm particularly quite a fan of is the schema FAQ. It's, uh, people have made beautiful websites where you can just put your question and answer in, um, on the website and it will make the code for you. There's a link on my slide here. This, these slides will be sent to you after the webinar. Um, yeah, so you fill in your questions and your answers and you put it on your website and it basically gives, gives you more screen real estate. And it kind of looked like this. Um, so people, so I, look, I searched here for uh, a schema, FAQ generator, found this page and it, has, it normally will show the first three questions. Um, I expanded it and I show everything, but it just picks up so much of the search real estate. The scan result to a, um, a no-click search, obviously, but um, that is something that you have to take for granted because you will get so much more, um, yeah, as I said, I keep repeating myself, you get just way more real estate and you get more uh, vision, your, your presence get better. That's the word I was looking for. Um, and in your FAQ, you can even, um, make the text appear so people will actually click on your website. So how much does a shoe cost? Well, a vegan shoe costs between 60 and 120 euros. In my blog, I have listed all the links with the best website for the best price. Have a look. You can put stuff like that in there so people know, oh, maybe there's extra value in the content over there. But that was a really quick overview of um, how I would do. Um, I'm gonna stop my sharing right now on SEO and how to improve your reach. And I think we can go on to the Q and A now. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, so I've got a couple of questions have come in. Um, so I think some of these have been touched on, but actually if we could get sort of all the panelists um, thoughts on it. Um, so how do I find the right keywords for my niche? What tools can I use to find high volume keywords? Person says they've used SEMrush before, but what others are out there? So feel free to jump in if you've got something to say about this. Um, I, so, oh, sorry, we're going to go, Alex. <laughs> um, so for, from what I find, um, it would, if you just use one tool, it gives you a really narrow view into what you need to actually create. So you should really be using a whole variety of tools. So Search Console is one, and then you have, you know, Ahrefs, SEMrush. Um, you can manually type it in, you know, the way that was touched upon. Um, another thing you can look at is, you know, maybe even scraping the SERPs, so seeing what sort of content's being written about there. Um, that's really handy is the frequently asked or people also ask section. So that's something that maybe a lot of tools won't pick up, but um, you should be touching anyway. And then also reading reviews, I think, is a good one because um, that's where a lot of the complaints usually come out. And so you tackle two things in once um, by looking at the content you can create from reviews and also helping your existing customers. Cool. I guess to add on to that, um, keywords everywhere for me. 
Um, it's recently become a pay tool, um, so a little bit more annoying, but um, really great value. I'm not, it, it's ridiculously cheap. And um, you'll get uh, something appended to the side of your SERPs. So you can see similar keywords, you can see search volumes, and you can export those straight into their sort of dashboard area. You can export that all straight into um, uh, an Excel document or a Google Sheet, however you want to handle that. And then, yeah, it's, it's such a great jumping off point. Can also add to that, um, there's a tool called Keyword Shitter, and it you, <laughs> you put in one keyword and it just goes for it. There's no search volume data, which is the downside. But if, if you want a big list of topics, it's really good. Yeah. Um, someone else has asked, uh, my website's load speed is showing up as really slow. Where do I start with improving my page speed? Cool. Um, so start with some of the tools I've mentioned. Um, throw your URL into PageSpeed Insights, GC Metrics. Um, uh, there, there's more tools available as well. Look uh, objectively at what the recommendations are for using PageSpeed Insights. Be very aware that their lab data results aren't going to give you accurate timings. Um, a common one uh, a lot of people face is stuff around images. Um, Implementing the, the, the latest gen image formats is great. Can be a bit annoying from a dev resource point of view. Um, so to get around that, I'd recommend using a, a CDN like Cloudinary. Again, that's got paid and free tiers. Uh, but with that, you can uh, use sort of their URL API to offer the, the image at the correct resolution compressed. Um, that's a really great way to start. Another thing, make sure that um, you're serving the least amount of JavaScript and dynamic, especially when it comes to like tracking that you can get away with. So a lot of uh, people I've worked with just throw like hot jar straight on the site across the whole site. Yeah, it has really bad page speed implications. So if you're using that, try and limit it to a page that you're wanting to track, like don't just throw it everywhere. Um, and that's the same with sort of any uh, real user user data tools. Um, av avoid them as much as you can, unless you need to prove a point, really. Yeah, like just get rid of all the WordPress plugins that you don't use. Yeah. And, and take, take it easy on the pixels too. Mm. That's, that's a big one. Um, there's a tool I also want to add up. Pingdom has, I've, is really good next to GT Metrics. If you just Google page speed tests, those are the top ones that will come up. Um, and, and as Alex touched on earlier, there was the Web Dev Live, um, you know, conference online yesterday, which is available to everyone. It's three hours discussing how you can optimize your page speed. So if you really want to get into it from a dev perspective, you can. Um, and also one thing that does come up quite a lot is images. So um, you can install certain plugins. Um, you know, some plugins uh, work better than others, but you can install certain plugins which will optimize your images for you. And then with the, um, and a recommendation that keeps coming up for me for PageSpeed Insights is um, serve images in next-gen formats. Um, that, will, that won't work for all websites. So there was a website I was working on and that was a primary recommendation from the tool. But discussing with the developer, they have a lot of traffic from other search engines and other browsers which don't support WebP. So it's about checking your analytics to make sure you know where, where your traffic is coming from. So um, don't just trust one tool. Uh, do your research on that. Mm. Excellent. Um, someone else has just asked, where do I start with external link building and what would you suggest for a beginner? Yeah, um, so there's something that I touched on um, a bit earlier. Um, it was similar to what I was saying, um, how you don't need to build a huge elaborate campaign. It's about making sure you're, you're present in the space over time. So even if you're creating you know, small tweets, say for example, um, in, in your whole digital marketing and social media campaign, staying consistent and um, not being afraid to ask for a link. So if you do get a mention uh, from another you know, publication, just email them. It, it, you know, it doesn't, it's not a big ask. You, you know, you've given them a useful piece of information they, they, you know, they're likely to link back to you. Um, one key point we find in order to build links is having unique data sources. So it doesn't mean you have to do a whole bunch of research into a certain area, but say you have, you know, a small survey which you've commissioned, or you have an employee who works for your business who's building their brand, you know, having your own unique angle from it incentivizes people to build links for you. And I think that's a key difference between traditional PR and digital PR and link building. 
So um, I'd say those are the main, my main tips. I would say if you're um, a local business too, reach out to local news sources, um, local um, newspapers, bloggers, um, just people who are near you because they would love to like talk about the new thing in the neighborhood. Um, I've worked for um, on the side and do a bit of marketing freelancing too. And I've seen that work really well for like new barber shops, um, local cab companies, stuff like that. Um, just things that, that look like the, the neighborhood is growing and developing and businesses are flourishing. That's what people like to like brag and write about, about the neighborhood. Small businesses yeah. like to help each other. So they're likely to do that <laughs> to help you out. And there's, there's a lot of opportunity as well. Um, I found specifically within sort of B2B stuff, um, supplies and customers like reach out to the people that you already have relationships with build those relationships and just see you know is there anything that you can help them on is there anything that that they might have some insight on that you're working on um, leverage what you already have within your network is so, so powerful um, and one here which um, how do I get my mobile app to to appear higher in search results on Google Play. Um, I know Serena, you sort of touched on apps a little bit. Um, got anything else to sort of say about that? Mm. The approach is sort of similar to, um, you know, Amazon, like SEO sort of, which Alex will know all about, I'm sure. Um, so you, with, a, with an app listing, there's only so much you can do with the space. You've got the title, the subtitle, and the description. There's bits more like the, the logo and things like that. So um, the approach is similar to optimizing an actual website. Are your keywords in there? Um, is it easy to read? So that's a really big part of mobile um, app listings. Can you read it if it's a huge bunk? block of text telling your customers why your brand is so incredible, it's not going to appeal. Um, so, you know, following all these best practices and with Android, you have AB testing capabilities, which you don't have on iOS. So you can use that as a platform to test for your iOS users as well. So you can make even tiny tweaks. You can run these tests, you know, you should be running tests consistently. Even something as small as changing a slight word, plural, you know, plural to a slightly different one. Um, you, these CRO tests can make a really big um, impact over time. Excellent. Um, and um, one question, does URL structure actually matter that much? Alex, you look like you've got something to say on that one. <laughs> sure, yeah, um, it does, it really does. Um, it, it matters for a, a multiple of reasons. Uh, the most, uh, important for me is relevancy so not only are we looking for like the nice structure so we've got the in the SERP that if I've searched for a term I can see okay if I'm looking for men's shoes I can see okay we're under men's apparel or clothing or whatever inside the wider fashion brand um, it, that also as well as being great for users is great for search um, historically we've seen st stuff like anchor text optimization very similar principle if Google can see how your site is structured and how all the different areas are separated out then it can make a better informed decision about what category this this page will fit into and that kind of thing um, also you need to be careful about some of the tech stuff about training slashes and and duplicate pages and content and stuff like that um, so if you see any of those popping up in in your sort of audits uh, get a Google on that and and identify how you're going to fix those issues yeah Excellent. Um, I think that's all the questions we've got. Um, thank you guys for, for joining us today and um, for your expertise. It's been brilliant. And um, if anyone wants to uh, sign up to our newsletter at oneupcoworking.com, um, that's generally where we kind of promote all the, these. So we've been recording this today and we'll be sort of linking to, um, to the recording in that and also where we announce our next ones. Um, and uh, if you want to follow One Up Coworking, um, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, um, we've got uh, groups on Facebook and LinkedIn for One Up Coworkers, um, if anyone wants to follow us and uh, find out what we're up to. But um, thank you so much, guys, and um, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.